Hi everyone, and welcome to this special edition webinar featuring Aurelia with Rob Eisenberg. We'll be starting in three minutes. So we, again, we'll be starting in three minutes. See you guys very soon. Hi everyone, and welcome to this webinar uh, featuring Aurelia JS. We actually have the CEO, Rob Eisenberg, co-founder of the platform. He's here to speak on the actual subject and as well demo a few examples and samples and really help you discover its all full potential. So with that, I will give the platform up to Rob. Rob, you ready? I'm all set, thank you. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. And it's really a pleasure to be with you. And thank you everyone who is here attending. And I really respect uh, your time and interest in what we're building with Aurelia. Um, so uh, as was said, my name is Rob Eisenberg. I um, am a software developer and architect that has been working in the uh, space of front-end engineering for quite some time now. Um, over 10 years, I've been building basically tools and frameworks for front-end development across a host of platforms, including things like Windows, Unity 3D, uh, all the XAML platforms, uh, Flash, Flex, Silverlight, and the web. And um, it's really just been my passion for a very long time to make front-end development simpler, um, make it elegant, easy to build what you need to build as part of your job, and but to be able to do it without cutting corners as well, to be able to write really high-quality code, but, but to do it in an easy and sensible way. Um, in 2014, I spent some time working with Google as a full-time consultant to the Angular 2.0 team. And uh, I did that for about 10 months. They had hired me uh, because of my um, breadth of experience in this area. And after about 10 months or so, uh, it became abundantly clear that their vision and mine were not the same. We had a lot of disagreements across a lot of different areas. And at that time, I decided to leave. And when I left, I was still no less passionate about front-end development and helping developers to solve the problems that they face in the real world. So I began working on Aurelia. And it was in the uh, beginning of 2015 that we founded a new company, Durandal Inc., um, with me as the CEO, with a number of founders and a good-sized core team for the purpose of really bringing Aurelia to life as the platform solution uh, for future web development. Um, and uh, it's been a really exciting time over the last, uh, a little bit over a year as we've launched the product and seen just the fantastic community response to it. Uh, and so I'm, again, just really excited to be here with you today to show you what we've been working on. And hopefully you will see that uh, it's something that you're going to want to use in building apps in the future. 
Um, hey, Rob, can I quickly just interrupt? Uh, sure. If anybody has any questions, we highly recommend you that you actually just ask the questions on the YouTube channel. So in the comment section, just ask any questions there. We're checking them like all the time. So at the end, we can actually just review them so Rob can check them out. Rob, back to you. Thank you. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, uh, several things today. First, I just want to give you a, a high-level view of what it really is and the philosophy behind it, how it's put together. I want to take you through a few awesome things that it really can do, starting from the Hello World uh, and how that's unique even from other platforms. And then I want to take you through a few things that you may not have seen before. Um, and then I want to do a quick comparison with some other similar technology so you get a feel for um, how Aurelia fits in, how it plays in terms of its performance, its size, standards compliance, all these sorts of things. And then I want to give you a final update on the project. What is our status? What are we working on and our next steps? So you can have a feel for where we're at and where we're heading. So with that, let's begin by talking about what is Aurelia. And in its simplest form, it's just JavaScript. But it's actually ECMAScript 2015 and 2016 JavaScript. So we've written the framework and the platform from the beginning using the most modern JavaScript that we can. And we really wanted to imagine what would it be like to build a next generation platform starting with next generation JavaScript from the very beginning. So in its simplest form, Aurelia is just JavaScript, but it's very modern JavaScript. You also hear me referring, it, referring to it as a platform or, or a framework, and that's because it really is an, an all-encompassing uh, set of libraries to help you build front-end apps. Um, but it's not a monolithic framework or one gigantic library. It's actually a collection of collaborating libraries. So we've been very careful from an architectural perspective to take Aurelia and to break it into a number of smaller libraries that you will usually use as a group, um, but you could also use individually in other projects, some even on the server side, some in other non-Aurelia front-end projects as well. And we've just spent a lot of time architect architecting this in, in a way that is consistent with good architecture regardless of the platform in terms of just building these small focused libraries but they all can come together to give you a very rich application development experience. So what is the purpose of this JavaScript and this collection of libraries? Well, as I've mentioned, it's really about building JavaScript client apps. This could be apps for the browser. This could be hybrid mobile apps for phone and tablet. This could even be desktop applications via technologies like Electron or NWJS. So really, it's about building the front end of your application regardless of what platform you're on for the web or even uh, like I said, desktop or mobile. And it's about using open web technology to do that. We leverage, of course, in the same way that we leverage the most modern JavaScript, we also leverage the most modern capabilities of the web in terms of using the modern DOM so we have no abstractions away from the DOM to hinder performance or to cause memory problems. We are bare to the metal using the modern DOM APIs to their fullest. We also integrate with upcoming standards like web components. So you'll see as we go through the demos today, you'll see me using HTML template elements and things like this, which are part of the web components technology. So it's modern JavaScript, and it's the most modern in terms of its uh, use of the DOM and browser-based technologies. And it brings this all together for building the front end of your app, regardless of where you are going to be deploying through the browser or through um, uh, app stores or through um, just downloading and running an app on your desktop. What is the philosophy of, uh, of Aurelia? Well, first of all, what we've built here is completely open source and it's MIT licensed. So you can take this code, you can take these libraries, and you can use them in just about any scenario you can imagine uh, with no fear of any sort of legal or IP issues. The MIT license is a very permissive license. It's the same license that uh, projects like jQuery use, for example. It's very common for web technology to be MIT licensed. So open source, very permissively licensed. And it really is really about helping you to write clean code. And it accomplishes this by providing some simple conventions, very much the way a lot of modern MVC frameworks work. So if you've ever looked at Ruby on Rails, if you've ever looked at sort of the more recent versions of um, of uh, Microsoft's MVC framework or any of the modern MVC type frameworks, they usually have a little bit of conventions built in. And this allows you to build your apps in certain ways 
and for the framework to stay out of your way, for you to get really clean code, really high productivity, do things the right way, and not get bogged down with the details of the framework so much. And that is really the same philosophy that we have with Aurelia. Clean code through simple conventions. We also leverage a lot of modern tooling. Um, and this just enables developers to be very productive. It, again, it helps in enabling you to use the most modern JavaScript in your own apps, the most modern testing capabilities and linting capabilities, and all the sort of things that you'll want for building a real production app. And so we really favor a lot of modern tooling, and we put that together for you so you don't have to worry about how that all works out. And then I would say that we really focus on what I call the illities. And these are things like testability, maintainability, extensibility, learnability, all these sorts of uh, characteristics of the app that you would like to have but are easy to go by the wayside if you're not working really hard on them. And what Aurelia wants to do is make it easy for you to accomplish these things, make it easy for you to write testable code, easy for you to write maintainable code, easy for your code base to be extensible and for new developers to come on board and to learn it. And so this is really baked into the core philosophy of Aurelia. Uh, in terms of everything that we're doing, how we're building the framework, and how we're helping you to build apps, we're always thinking about these sorts of things. The great thing I mentioned earlier is that uh, we've only announced Aurelia a little bit over a year ago. That was the alpha release. And we've seen a rapid adoption and a very large active community growing up around this. Uh, just to give you some stats, within a one-year time period, we have, across our libraries, um, over 7,000 stars on GitHub. We have over 3,000 developers um, in our Gitter chat room with approaching a quarter million messages between those developers. Um, so a lot of activity, huge group. We have over 300, uh, I think we got about 310 contributors to the project now. And we've got a core team of about 15 developers. So it's a very successful project a fantastic community, a very welcoming, engaging community, very active community, and a lot of participation. So I, it's been really exciting to see that happen. Um, and that's an important characteristic of what we're building. And on top of that, though, we wanted to make sure that everything we were building was commercially backed. One of the biggest problems in the JavaScript world, if you're um, trying to support the, 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 the technology that you're building, is a lot of these frameworks and libraries have no real substantial backing behind them. Even the ones that are built by large companies have no official channel for support, no official channel for training or consulting. There's no way to opt into any commercial options that could give you prioritized bug fixes or any of these sorts of things, provide you the support that you would have, say, if you adopted a native platform. So all of that infrastructure around native platforms is very much missing in a lot of the JavaScript world. And what we have done is said, you know, we're going to solve this technology problem, but we're also going to solve this side of the business problem that's really important for this. And so that's another important aspect of what we're doing with Aurelia is making sure that there's a solid business and all those options, commercial options, are there uh, for you to optionally uh, take advantage of if you desire. Well, that's enough of the what. Let's actually build uh, build some uh, little demos here and give you a feel for how Aurelia is used. If you want to get started with Aurelia, usually the best way is to download one of our beginner kits. Um, and there's a getting started guide in our documentation, which will take you through downloading one of these kits. Uh, there can be unzipped. There's nothing that you need to install, no setup you need to do, nothing at all. With these beginner kits, they're just download, unzip, and go. Uh, we tried to make that really, really easy. After you get through the beginning process of learning and becoming familiar with things and you're ready to start building a production application, we have a separate set of kits which are configured for production workflows. Um, and those do uh, you know, require a little bit of installation and setup. Uh, but that also is going to bring you a lot richer functionality and things that you would want if you're really building a production app. But when you're just getting started, you can use one of these beginner kits and not have to worry about all that, and instead focus on learning and experimenting with the framework. Let me just uh, show you real quick our website, because this is the place you're going to want to go to get more information about Aurelia and to download these kits and read the documentation. So obviously, we have our homepage. You can learn about all kinds of things like support, consulting, training. You can take a look at our core team, our founders, and everybody that's officially working on the project. The place you'll probably spend most of your time is in the docs. 
Um, and there's a number of articles over here. You can see there's kind of different profiles depending on how you describe yourself to get different uh, kinds of uh, content. You can also see that all of our libraries are documented, all the methods, classes. So if you're interested in learning about how dependency injection works, you can click on that library and you can come in here and you can look at uh, any of the classes that are exported, such as the container, and see all the information about it. You'll probably want to start in this article section of the documentation, uh, reading through it and learning a bit about Aurelia and how to use it. And the place you'll really start is in this Getting Started Guide. And here are these two kits that I just talked about that you can choose between based off of whether you want to do standards compliant JavaScript, basically, or whether you want to add strong typing to it through using something like TypeScript. And so this Getting Started Guide will take you through building your first app. Um, so this is a good resource to know about when you're getting started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, one of our kits, and I'm going to build a sample app uh, from scratch for you. So here I've got uh, Visual Studio Code open, which I'm going to be using for uh, working uh, today on Aurelia. You can use any code editor you want. We have great support for uh, Atom, for Sublime, uh, for VS Code, WebStorm, Visual Studio, all the popular editors. Um, VS Code has really fantastic support for IntelliSense on JavaScript, and you'll see that as I go along. So it's a really nice choice. It's also free, open source, and cross-platform. So it's, it's an excellent choice. I'm going to use that today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by building a real sample app here. Um, I'm going to keep it real simple at first. The place we're going to look at beginning is the index HTML. And uh, this is just the place you would probably look with any sort of application. And so with an Aurelia app, it's a JavaScript app. So you're not going to see a whole lot in the HTML file. The HTML file, the index HTML, just serves to get the application started. Um, it's a, a bit like um, it, it bootstraps the application. So let's look at what's, what we have in this index HTML. It's going to look almost identical for every Aurelia app that you write. In the head of the document, we have the title and some metadata. Uh, that's really not that important. Let's collapse that. Um, the really interesting part is in the body. And in the body, you're going to see that we have a couple of script tags. The first one is system.js. System.js is the library that implements the ECMAScript uh, 6 module loader. So in modern JavaScript, we actually have modules. We actually have classes and a lot of things that other platforms have had for a long time. And so that's all been brought into modern JavaScript. But to work with modules, we need a module loader. This is the thing that understands the dependencies between modules, makes sure these things get resolved correctly, and optionally um, lazily loads modules if necessary. So system.js is going to give us the module loader. Uh, config.js is a file that configures the loader. It's uh, generated by our tooling, and I'm not going to go into the details of that right now. But suffice it to say that when you request a module, that lives somewhere on the web server. And config.js has the information for the loader that tells it how to map from the user-friendly module name, which you will use in your code, back to the path on the web server where it's located. You don't write this by hand. The tooling generates it, but you just include it so that the module loader has the information it needs to properly load modules. Now, once you've got your module loader and its configuration scripts in place, all you need to do is bootstrap the framework. And you do that by calling system import. System is the API provided by system.js to actually import modules. And the Aurelia bootstrapper module is uh, one of the modules that we provide, its sole purpose being starting up your application. It, it configures things, it gets everything in place, and then renders your application. And one of the things that this bootstrapper module does is it will look at your HTML page, and it will look to see, do you have any Aurelia app attributes anywhere in your HTML page? And if it finds those, it understands that you, as a developer, intend the element that that attribute is on to be transformed into an Aurelia app. In other words, Aurelia is going to render the user interface into that element. And by convention, if you don't provide any value for this, it's going to go out and it's going to assume that your app uh, has a root component uh, called app. And in Aurelia, everything is built in terms of components. Um, every component has two parts. It has a JavaScript part and an HTML part. The JavaScript part has the state and behavior of the component. The HTML part has the content, what is rendered um, by HTML and CSS. And in this case, 
every application in Aurelia has what's called a root component. You can liken this uh, a bit to something like a main window or a main layout or a master page if you've used a number of different, depending on what your background is. Uh, but it's that root component that everything is inside of. Because in Aurelia, we break user interfaces down into small pieces. Inside of your root component, you might have child components like a navigation component and uh, some, something that displays the current screen that you're navigated to. And inside of that screen, you might have child components that display forms and different kinds of things. Uh, so, But at the root of the app is this one app component. And by default, the convention is that it's called app. So Aurelia knows that if you don't specify something different, it's going to go look for this app component. And it's going to load it up, and it's going to render it into the body tag. Now, all these things are configurable and overridable, but this is the simple set of conventions, and it's the way that most people do things. So let's write this app component. Uh, to do that, I'm going to come over to my source folder, and I'm going to create this component. And remember that components in Aurelia typically have two parts, the JavaScript part and the HTML part. So first, I'm going to create the app.js file. That's going to be the JavaScript part of my component. And I'm going to create a class. Hi, Rob. It looks like yes. you went a bit mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Sorry, I'm not sure what just happened there. <laughs> I might have bumped the mute button on my mic. Okay, so I'm going to create the. Uh, I'm not sure where it cut out, so let me just back up a minute. Um, I'm going to create this app level component, and it has the two parts, the JavaScript part and the HTML part. So I'm going to create the JavaScript part first called app.js, and I'm just going to create a simple class called app that's exported, and I'm going to give it a constructor with a simple property called and that's it. So this is the JavaScript part of our component. It doesn't really get too much simpler than that. I'm going to write the view part of the component now. And we give it the same name, app, but with a different file extension, app HTML. And the framework just understands this is how you build components. So all you have to do is follow this naming convention. I have my JavaScript file, and I have my HTML file for each component. And inside of the view tag, the template tag comes from um, the web component specifications. So we're actually using Web Components technology to define the view for our Aurelia component. So every view will have the template. And for this simple example, I'm just going to put an H1 tag in here. And I want to render a message out here. And what's cool about Aurelia is inside of the view for a component, all the properties and methods of your JavaScript class are available in the view. So this message property is going to be available inside of this template here. And all we do is use the simple binding syntax, indicate that we want that message to be rendered into the H1 uh, tag's content. And if you're familiar with ECMAScript 2015, you'll notice that this dollar sign curly brace syntax is actually the same syntax that is used in ECMAScript 2015 string template literals. Um, so we have borrowed the syntax wherever we could from modern JavaScript and made that work inside of HTML where appropriate. So here, the same syntax you use in JavaScript for interpolating values or variables into text, you can use that also in HTML. Now I'm going to go ahead and get um, this running. I'm using our production kit, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and start up a little web server here to serve this content. And then I'm going to jump over to the browser and refresh it. And you'll see now that, of course, there is that component that we wrote. And if we look in the DOM, let me just make this a bit bigger for you. And we look at the elements, you'll see that there's our body. And right into the body, it rendered that h1 tag. And inside of the h1 tag is the content of our message. So it's really that simple. And in fact, this is the way that you're going to go about building all sorts of things in Aurelia. And what I want to point out when I talk about awesome things that Aurelia can do, look at the JavaScript here. You should notice something is missing from the JavaScript. And it's fantastically missing. And what is that? Well, you don't see the Aurelia framework. You don't see me importing any third-party libraries. 
You don't see me doing any configuration of the JavaScript. You don't see me having to add any metadata, any of that kind of work. What we have here is the ability to create components out of which your app is built by using plain standards-based JavaScript with no intrusion into that JavaScript from the library or framework itself. Now, in more advanced scenarios, you do have to add, work with Aurelia's libraries directly. However, in a large percent of the cases, you don't have to import anything that's Aurelia specific. And in the even the places that you do, it's extremely minimal. So the framework stays out of your way. And what I'm showing here, I, I consider it to be a very awesome thing because there is, in fact, no other framework or library in existence that I am aware of that lets you build UI components out of plain JavaScript without even having to import any library-specific um, configuration or APIs at all. This is 100% your JavaScript here, which means when you're writing your app with Aurelia, the bulk of what you're going to be writing is going to be your code. You're not going to be writing Aurelia code, per se. You're not going to be using our APIs extensively. You're not going to find our APIs littered throughout your code. And remember, we talked about the illities that we try and focus on, maintainability, extensibility, testability. The more that the framework stays out of your way, that you don't have to engage our APIs, but that you can just write pure, plain JavaScript, the easier it is to accomplish all those things. You get much higher maintainability from the beginning just by the nature of this framework. You get better extensibility. It's much easier to test these things. So although you're looking at a very simple example right now, it shows something that I think is completely awesome and very, very important to the development of real-world applications, which is the framework gets out of your way and lets you write your code. Now let's move on and let's do some other things. I want to go beyond this, and I want to show you um, a little bit more data binding. So I'm going to add some properties here. Pretty. And I'm going to add a last name property. Come down, and I'm going to add a uh, I'm going to add a computed property, and I'm going to call it full name. It's going to have just a I'm going to uh, use a bit of string interpolation to have the the uh, last returned from the property. OK, if you haven't seen this before, these are property getters, and it's standard JavaScript. And this backtick syntax with the dollar sign is a modern JavaScript feature for interpolating variables into uh, strings. And as you can note, again, it's the same syntax we borrowed for our templating language directly out of JavaScript. So we try to be consistent there. But what I want to show you is how I can now have user input to type the first name and last name, and how I can render the full name in real time. As I mentioned, every property is um, available uh, in the view that is in the JavaScript. So I'm going to put an input control in here, and I want its value property to be uh, bound to the uh, first name property of our, uh, our JavaScript model. Okay. And uh, Hi, Ron. Uh, looks like you're muted right now. Sorry. It, for some reason, keeps muting and unmuting. So uh, <laughs> no worries. I'm, I'm not real sure what's happening there. Um, I'm going to bind the uh, last name to this second uh, input. I'm going to put the full name down here. Interpolated. I'm going to use another interpolated value down here to get the full name. All right. Let's go back over to our running app. And here you can see, let me make it a little bit bigger for you, that now we've got the first name rendering in this input box, the last name rendering in this input box, and the full name rendering below it. And as I type, you'll see also that name updates on the fly. This is Aurelia's data binding. It's extremely powerful. And again, notice that it's just plain JavaScript that we're writing here. Simple properties, 100% pure vanilla JavaScript. But we're able to render that in our view using this very simple templating language. 
So before we had the string interpolation, it works fine for binding into the content. But we can also data bind any HTML attribute by simply appending dot bind to the attribute name. So here we're binding the first name to the value, and here we're binding the last name to the value. And it's really that simple. What the dot bind, uh, what we call it's a binding command, what it tells it really to do is it tells it to use the most reasonable binding behavior based on what attribute and element you're data binding. So if you're data binding the value of an input control, it knows that it should do bidirectional or two-way data binding, meaning that it will flow data from your uh, model class into the view and from your view back into your JavaScript model. It will flow the data both directions. Now, um, anything other than a form control, anything other than something that wants user input in that way, is going to use one directional data flow by default. So Aurelia just knows this is the best practice for, you know, so the href um, of an A tag, it just knows that you want to use one directional data binding. But it knows that for things like inputs and uh, text areas and selects that you're going to want to use two-way data binding. And so this is the way that the convention just makes learning and using the framework simple. But of course, you can always override any of the behavior you want. So if I want to be explicit and say that this is using two-way data binding, I can just say two-way. Or if I want it to only use one-way data binding, I can say one-way for that unidirectional data flow. Or if I only want it to bind one time and never synchronize thereafter, I can say one time. You have, we have the conventions, but you also have full control over every aspect of the framework. But these conventions make it really, really simple and powerful to build things. OK, so this is uh, you know, like 60 or 70% of the data binding framework that you've now learned here. And you can see how simple it is with just interpolation or simple binding. Let's go on and let's do a little bit more here. I want to have a list of friends. So I have a list of array, and then I want to have a method called add friend list of friends. So my add friend method is going to, uh, every time it executes, it's going to add a new friend to my list. And I'm going to have another property I'm going to call potential friend. So it's going to store the name of somebody that might be my friend if I whether I choose to add them. And if we have a value in potential friend, we want to push it into our friends array. Okay, just a pretty pretty uh, straightforward. After we uh, and, and after we do do that, a real simple here um, for adding friends. Again, this is just pure JavaScript. This is how you might do it if you're just doing it in JavaScript, representing the state and behavior of your component. We have the ability to add friends, and we're going to add a friend for whatever we have in this potential friend uh, property. Let me show you how that plays out. We're going to add down below here. Um, let me just add a little, little br. We're going to have another input. Its uh, name, and we're going to that whatever we're typing in this input box will always be synchronized with that property. And then we're going to have a little to add a friend. How do we make this button trigger that method add friend on our component? Well, it's really, really any event in the DOM, you can append the word trigger. And when that event fires, it will trigger the method on the component. So I can say click trigger equals add. So whenever that button is clicked, the add friend method will execute. If there is a value in potential friend, which you can see is coming from this input, if it has a value, it's going to push it into our friends array and then clear out the uh, potential friend value. 
Now we want to do one more thing. We want to be able to have a list of our friends. So let's add a UL. And for every friend in our array, we want to have um, an LI. So how do we do that? Well, in Aurelia, we simply say repeat for. And this is going to generate an LI for every friend in that friends array. And notice that this syntax for friend of friends, if you're familiar with modern JavaScript, ES 2015, it adds a new loop type called the for of loop for looping over any type of iterable, arrays, maps, sets, etc. And again, we've adopted the same syntax that you would learn for JavaScript. And we've enabled that syntax simply inside of our HTML templating language. So you can repeat over any array simply by saying repeat for friend of friends. And inside of this LA, of course, I want to render out the friend. Okay, That friend is our local variable inside of the loop. Because this is a data binding framework, what this means is as that array changes over time, the LIs will be generated or removed over time. So everything will be kept in sync. OK. You can see as I type and I hit Add Friend, we see Bob is added. And then the uh, potential friend is cleared out, thereby clearing out the uh, friend's name box. All right, so we've got one-way binding, string interpolation, two-way binding, repeating over arrays. And again, notice that our JavaScript is just a plain JavaScript class. In fact, there's nothing remarkable about this code whatsoever. And that's actually a fantastic positive characteristic for your components to have. It's just vanilla JavaScript. Well, let me show you a couple really cool things that Aurelia can do uh, that go beyond this. And the first thing I want to show you is that every component is a custom element. And so because I have this app root level component, I can actually render it again using an HTML tag called app based off of the name of the component. Now, I don't want to do this because this is going to recursively render forever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an input of type um, checkbox, and I'm going to bind the visibility of or the presence of this app component to whether or not this checkbox is checked. And in a reference to elements, to create a reference to an element, you simply use the ref attribute and give it a name. So we're going to call this the uh, recursive uh, checkbox. And then I'm going to conditionally um, have this app HTML element uh, rendered in here. And to do that, I use our if behavior. So I say if.bind recursive. In other words, I've given this, I've made this input of type checkbox uh, referenceable with the name recursive. And then I've data bound this app component's visibility, or not, not really its visibility, but really its presence inside of the DOM to the checked property of that input control. So as I check it, I should now see the entire app recompose itself inside of itself recursively. So let's see if this works. Let me just add some here. And as I check the checkbox, you see we get another instance of app composed internally. And of course, it has its own state. Every component is related the way a, a component should be in Aurelia. So the state doesn't mix between the two. And we can go on and on and on like that. Um, and so every component, again, without changing any code, pure plain vanilla JavaScript, pure HTML, every component you write can be used as a custom element. And so you get really great reusability this way. But it gets even better than this, because this is static composition, meaning I knew that I wanted the app component here at runtime. But what if you don't know what component you want at runtime? What if you've got data coming from the database or configuration data or based on a different user, based off all these runtime data characteristics, you need to compose different components based off of that data? Well, then you can use this compose element in Aurelia. 
and it has a view model will point to uh, give it a module ID to any component module and it will dynamically uh, render that component as well and what's really cool about this is that because we have data binding you can actually bind this view model to some property component class and as that property changes over time Aurelia will recompose the content of the DOM based off of that value and so this gives you extremely dynamic powerful user interface composition where even the entirety of your user interface it's possible to construct at runtime based off of data so it doesn't have to be static all right so that is uh, some of the really cool things that really can do. Again, it's about plain, simple JavaScript, no framework intrusion or as little as possible. It's about having a simple but powerful data binding language. You've learned most of it right here. You've learned how to use repeats and ifs. You've learned how to do references. You've learned one-way and two-way data binding, and you've learned string interpolation. That's the bulk of what you need to do. Furthermore, you've learned that all the components uh, can be used either statically or dynamically by using them as an HTML element in your view, or by using this compo special compose element that we provide to dynamically render different components based off of data. By combining even the features I've shown here to you in the last 20 minutes, it's literally possible to create just about any application you can imagine. Um, so I'm gonna stop there with what I call the kind of the hello world demo. I'm gonna show you a few other demos that are um, a bit more uh, advanced and just to highlight a few of the cool things that Aurelia can do that you may not have seen in other places at all either. So I'm going to open up um, some demos that I have here. And Now, I'm going to show you a few more demos. We'll start at the index HTML, just like we did before. Notice how this index HTML is the same as the other one. It's a completely different app, but usually your index will be just about the same for every app. So you can see it's got source, it's got config, it's got the bootstrapper. This time, I've also included bootstrap to just get a few default styles. The main difference you'll see is that this Aurelia app attribute now has a value whereas before it didn't have a value. Before, we loaded everything up by convention. But if you provide a value to that attribute, then you can actually write a special main module that gets access to the Aurelia framework object and lets you configure the framework before it starts. So here I'm just telling it to use all the standard configuration options to turn on our logging for development, to start up the framework, and then to set our root component to this special root component for this particular demo. So as I mentioned, we have these conventions, but you can always override things. <clears throat> and even when you override it and take control, you still have a very simple and elegant API that you can use. So here I want to show you a capability of Aurelia called HTML components. And this uh, is a capability that allows you to write custom elements or components in Aurelia using only HTML and no JavaScript whatsoever. So let me actually just show you the demo. Uh, and this is just a very simple uh, demo of a couple of elements that input your first name and a color, and then render out this name tag component. You can see um, if I change the name to Rob, it's there, and if I change the color to blue, it's there. So you can see how the component is updating in real time based off of the data that I'm typing in these boxes. Let me show you how this is built. Again, just like before, we have our app component, our root component. And you can see that it's just a simple class with a first name and a color property. And then you can see in its view, and you see that there's a form here that's, again, using some bootstrap, but it's just collecting the first name and the color values, and it's binding to them. But now you can see something we haven't seen before, which is a custom element uh, called name tag, which I wrote for this demo. And the name tag has its own properties, such as color, to bind in the color from this input control, and it also is able to bind the first name into the content of the name tag. Now, the cool thing about this name tag component is that not a single bit of JavaScript is involved in authoring it. In Aurelia's views, 
uh, views are encapsulated, and you can require certain resources into your views. You can require custom elements. You can require in uh, extensions to the binding system. It's a very fully extensible pipeline for your view that allows you to extend our templating language in all sorts of ways. And so what I'm doing here is I'm basically importing or requiring in an HTML file. And when you require an HTML file in Aurelia, it automatically transforms that HTML file into a component that can be used as a custom element. So because we're importing the name tag HTML file, we have a name tag custom element in our uh, view that we can use. And let me just show you uh, the component itself is in name tag HTML. And you can see that it's just uh, HTML. <clears throat> it has you know that text, hello, my name is. There's some CSS that we're applying. Um, the interesting thing is you can see this content tag. This is, again, borrowed from web components. The Shadow DOM specification allows us to con do con what's called content projection. So that means that whatever is the content of the custom element is, whatever is inside of the name tag, when it's rendered, is going to be projected into this location in the view so that the name, in this case, will be rendered inside of the body uh, div. So you can see that we have this HTML here. The other cool thing you can see we can do in our views is we can actually import CSS. So this name tag CSS is the CSS that is only for this particular component. So we can ensure that the CSS that's required for the name tag element to render properly is always loaded and available before the component renders. And so you can just write CSS like normal. Here I've written some CSS to make it look like a name tag. And I've required that inside of my name tag component so that that CSS is there and the name tag gets styled correctly. You can also see that I have on my template some special attributes. One is called bindable, and this allows me to declare properties on the HTML element that I can data bind to. So here I'm saying bindable color, and then when I use that element, I have a color attribute, which I can bind to. I also have this property, uh, I also have a special property called CSS, which really provides in order to let you interpolate values into the style. So you can see that the style, uh, background style, is bound to whatever that bindable color is. And this is how whenever you set the color over here to this data binding expression, it will flow into the name tag element and style the background with whatever that color is. So you can see, you could write JavaScript to do all this kind of stuff, and more advanced to really components always uh, usually involve JavaScript, just like in the Hello World demo I showed you with AppJS and AppHTML. And the component here that is AppJS and AppHTML. But for really simple components, components where it's really just a reusable view with a little bit of templating and some properties that you need to set, you don't have to worry about writing any JavaScript. You can just write the HTML. And then when you import it into your view, you now have a reusable custom element that um, can render itself entirely from HTML. You can see, again, I can use it as many times as I want. It's completely element. OK? Pretty cool. So that's what we call HTML-only components. Uh, hi, Rob. Can I cut for a minute? Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Just so we can start already with the Q&A, if that's fine with you. Uh, I guess so. I was hoping to have a little bit more time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we can cut the rest of the presentation. I thought I had a full hour to present. I'm sorry. No worries. If you want, uh, let's give it about five more minutes, and then we can start the Q&A. OK. Well, yeah. um, sure, let me do a few more demos. Um, let me show you another demo here, uh, one I call metaprogramming components. Uh, app I'm rendering. And I want to show you um, another component. Uh, example. Here I've got first name text being rendered. But what's cool about this example is I'm actually writing my component with Markdown. Now this is not something that's built into the framework, but this shows the extensibility of the framework. You can actually teach Aurelia how to interpret different types of files and different modules. And so what happens here is I wrote a plugin to Aurelia that lets you require any markdown file, and it turns any markdown file into a custom element. And here's the markdown file. You can see it's just got some basic markdown. It even has content projection into the markdown. 
And inside of, a of the component, I'm just importing that markdown file and then using it as a custom element. Again, this is not something that Aurelia does out of the box, but you can tap into our view engine and teach it how to load and render different file types inside of a view. So that's really cool. Um, let me show you a bit more um, of what it can do. I'll show you another quick example called bindings. And a lot of people don't realize that the text we have in Aurelia that we've been binding to is um, actually decoupled from our templating language. So here we have a very simple demo like what I showed you before, but I want to show you inside of this binding syntax demo, we, again, we have an app JS just like before, but look in app HTML. Do you notice something here? I'm using an ng model attribute, and I'm using double curlies. Well, it turns out that Aurelia's binding syntax is decoupled from the templating language, so I can actually, on a per view basis or even globally, override the data binding syntax with custom syntax. So here I've written a real simple plugin that implements a segment of AngularJS's data binding syntax, and by importing it into this view, I've effectively changed the syntax for data binding in this view. So now I can use Angular syntax. Now it's still Aurelia under the hood, and it's still using all of our mechanisms to actually do the data binding, but instead we've got syntax that looks exactly like Angular. Now I actually can show you something even cooler, which is if you look inside of our name tag component, the name tag component is actually importing another syntax based off of Knockout. So you can see it's got data binding using Knockout syntax. So again, I'm not actually using Angular or Knockout, but instead, the framework is actually so extensible that you can teach it new types of syntax or even make it compatible with the syntax of other frameworks by simply writing a plugin and dropping it into the view. And it's still Aurelia under the covers. This performs way better than Angular or Knockout, but you've got the syntax from those. And in fact, they're co-mingling. The app component is using Angular syntax, and the name tab component is using Knockout syntax, and they're working together seamlessly. Um, so this is just an example of how powerful and extensible Aurelia is. Um, and in fact, you, you could do all sorts of things. One of our core team members just wrote a plugin for React that enables the same thing with React. In fact, you just simply install the plugin, and then you can require into any view, using this special plugin syntax, any React component, any native React component, can be required into an Aurelia view, and then it can be used as a custom element. And internally, it will use the React component to render. And you can even data bind to it, flowing unidirectionally data in to that React component, and it will automatically re-render when any of these values change based off of Aurelia's binding system. So you can see that even for libraries like React, if you want to use some cool React component you found with Aurelia, you just drop this plugin in, and then you just require in the native React component without making any changes to its source code or anything at all, and it just works in Aurelia automatically as a custom element. So these are the types of things you can do with Aurelia to extend the framework, to do all kinds of amazing things, and to make it real simple and elegant for you as developers to build applications. If I can just take um, three more minutes, um, let me just return to my deck and show a couple of uh, quick comparisons with other frameworks. Real quick, how does Aurelia do on size? Well, it's actually quite good on size. It's right in the middle of the size range. On the low end, you've got something like React plus Redux, which is not really a framework. It's not all encompassing. Uh, so it's not really the same category, but that's obviously the smallest. 139K is its size. I have question marks for the second size because um, it's not really clear how large it would be once you kind of add all the pieces that you would on your project, because people usually customize and add a lot of third-party things in this case. Angular 1, pretty small. 152 is the standard configuration. 235 is what most people, or 152 is the minimal. 235 is what most people use. That includes a router, HTTP animation. Polymer has two different configurations. Um, question marks I have for the third, because it, 302k does not actually include a router or an HTTP client, and I don't think it includes animation either. When you get down to Aurelia, 255 is our uh, minimum. The 323 includes the base plus a router animation and HTTP client. Um, as you go up, things get larger. When you get to Angular 2, you get something that's way off, 
uh, in Crazy Land. It's um, 999K is the minified version that includes an HTTP client and a router, and that does not still does not include um, um, an animation system. And you can see that that's basically has feature parity with Ember, so it's more than twice the size of Ember uh, to get the same features, and it's more than three times the size of Aurelia, and it still doesn't have the same features parity with Aurelia. So Angular 2 is way off on the large size. Aurelia is sitting right in the low, uh, mid to low area and has a lot of bang for buck in the features. Uh, performance is fantastic with Aurelia. Using an independent benchmark of rendering performance, Aurelia is pretty much right at the top of the list. The only thing close to it is Angular 2, and it just kind of depends on the browser and the uh, you know, um, operating system and all these kind of things, which one comes out faster. But they're both right there at the top. The second number set of numbers for Aurelia is using a, a new plugin we have for UI virtualization, which allows Aurelia to only render portions of lists that are visible. So you can see that with that, Aurelia becomes twice as fast at list rendering than the next fastest, fra fastest framework. Uh, so fantastic performance. Highly standards compliant. Uh, both Aurelia and Polymer are the two most standards compliant, using very compliant HTML, modern JavaScript, and having full support for web components. Um, really strong separated presentation pattern. You saw how we kept that JavaScript and HTML nice and cleanly separated and how you had pure JavaScript. Uh, Aurelia and Ember are two of the best at this. Angular 1, OK, as you get to the right kind of side of the screen, things kind of go downhill from there. Uh, Aurelia, very unobtrusive. Again, remember the demos I showed you, just vanilla JavaScript. The framework just stays out of your way. You don't get that intermingling of code from the library in with your own code very much at all. Highly interoperable. I mean, you saw me even show how uh, we have a plugin for using React components directly inside of Aurelia. We can do the same thing with Polymer components. And in fact, you can extend Aurelia in all sorts of ways to make it just work natively by mixing and matching just about anything you want. Highly interoperable, um, especially compared to other frameworks. Again, on the business side of things, full corporate commitment, full official support opportunities, full official training, full set of official partners, uh, consulting services, uh, enterprise support, all these sorts of things that you would expect from a native platform that, say, a Microsoft or an Apple was producing, we're working on and are producing for the web platform. And so we're really excited. We think that's a really important part of the um, uh, of, the, of the puzzle. So Aurelia is doing really well in terms of how it compares to other frameworks. Um, the status is that it is in a beta 1 with a stable API, extremely fully featured, docs, apps in development and production, fantastic growing community, uh, and as I mentioned, there's all kinds of opportunities if you need training, consulting, or support. And of course, we have a global partner network as well. Um, we are heading towards our release candidate in the next month or two, we believe. And so we're just polishing things up, fixing some bugs, adding more documentation, and syncing with the latest versions of some compiler and uh, package dependencies and standards. So I think it's a fantastic time to begin working with Aurelia and um, trying it out and building stuff with it. And we're really excited about the future. And with that, let's uh, jump into any questions we have. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Rob. Sure. All right. Our first question is, is Kendall UI Bridge is completely ready to use with Aurelia? Um, the Kendall UI Bridge is a, uh, just as an explanation for people listening, is a project by several members of the community who have um, a love for the Kindle UI uh, widget toolkit. And what they've done is they've gone and they've built a set of custom elements that make Kindle UI um, really, really nice to use in Aurelia. You get just custom HTML elements. You can use data binding and Aurelia's templating, and everything is uh, fully integrated in that way. I believe that they have almost full support for every component, both the open source and commercial components. I have not personally used the library in any projects, uh, but it, from I communicate with their uh, project um, leaders frequently. And my understanding is that they're almost ready to release a, uh, an official beta or release candidate, something of that nature, 
that kind of bumps up uh, their official standing on you know what what is supported. Uh, I know of a number of people that are using it successfully, and um, so if you like Kendo UI and you like Aurelia, you should definitely use that together. And I could say that just from looking at Kendo UI and how it works with other frameworks, I think that the Aurelia implementation of their components is probably the nicest, most elegant, cleanest way of using Kendo, even probably better than using them natively without a framework. So it's, it's really cool. Great. Our next question is, will the documentation be approved anytime soon? Uh, yes, in fact, there's several articles being worked on right now. It's hard to answer that question because some people say that they love our docs and they think they're perfect. Other people say, when are you going to improve it? It's very much an opinion-oriented thing. What I can tell you is that there's a lot more article content that is coming out. The API docs uh, document every public API and all the repos, all classes, methods, interfaces, properties, etc. cetera. Um, that's all there. I uh, assume that the questioner is asking about the actual how-to articles. And we've got a full plan for that and a lot more articles that are being worked on right now and that are coming out. They'll be coming out incremental, incrementally, as well as uh, multicultural support for translations and other languages. That's on the way as well. So the answer is yes, but documentation is highly opinionated, uh, what people think about that. And it's always an ongoing process. And so yes, we are improving it. Great. And next is, can I use HTML only tags as resources? Can I use HTML only tags as what? Resources. Uh, I'm not really sure what that question means. I, okay. You can create the HTML only tags. You can make them global and use them across all your views. You can import them into individual views and use them uh, as needed as a custom element. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what else the question is asking in that case. All right, uh, Paul. If you want, you could retype your question again so we can come back to it. Uh, next is uh, when will we, we be able to try out a demo of Aurelia's interface? Okay, so Aurelia Interface is a commercial library that we're working on. It's an optional add-on to Aurelia, and uh, it basically gives you a set of components you can build apps with. Um, you can, it's highly uh, focused on hybrid mobile app development, and it skins and themes and behaves differently across different devices, such as iOS and Android, but it also is a set of components for uh, browser-based apps using Angular, or sorry, uh, Google's material design. <clears throat> And I can't give you a date on that, sorry. We're working as fast as we can. It's extremely complicated. And uh, we have a high bar for quality. So we'll have that as soon as we have that. OK. Um, next is, how does it handle large volumes of bound data regarding changes in UI updates? Very well, in fact, because Aurelia is different from something like Angular, which had a massive problem with that. So Angular 1 and Angular 2 are both their binding systems are based on dirty checking, which means that uh, when certain events happen, it has to go check every single bound property to see if anything changed. And then if it did, it kind of raises an event. And so that means that as your application scales, the dirty checking has to work harder and harder to keep up. With Aurelia, we don't use dirty checking. We use an observer-based mechanism. So we know exactly what changes when it changes. And we don't have to check anything that hasn't potentially changed. And uh, Additionally, it's more efficient than other binding or observer-based systems like Knockout because we don't instantaneously update the DOM when a change happens. We batch all of those changes using the micro task queue of the browser so that all the changes happen and are, are aggregated and happen in a single <laughs> DOM turn. And this makes things very, very efficient. Um, and so we can render very quickly. We can update very quickly. And as an app grows larger and larger, that doesn't affect how quickly we can re-render or um, update at all. OK. Our next question is, are there any render to strange capabilities like React, for example, for pre-rendering? Are there any constraints? Are there uh, Aurelia, any? Yeah, Aurelia renders using the DOM. So it, it, it natively works against the DOM. However, the DOM globals are abstracted. Um, so while we don't support rendering into a string today, 
Um, we have a something that we're working on for later this year that is uh, that will enable rendering to string and rendering server side rendering of the entire app. Um, that is not in the current version. That is an optional add-on that we are working on for some time this year. Um, and um, that's basically what I can say about that. You can always render to a component and then get the inner HTML if you really just want to get a string. Okay. Uh, regarding framework mapping such as Knockout, is the, function is the functionality currently one-to-one -one or a work in progress? Um, <clears throat> in terms of the capabilities of Aurelia, you can pretty much do everything that any of the other major frameworks can do plus more. So um, Aurelia might do things in a different way, but it can accomplish all the same things. OK. Uh, this user mentioned he didn't catch it, but did you say if Aurelia uses DOM diffing? Aurelia does not need to use DOM diffing because it doesn't dirty check. It knows exactly what has changed when it has changed, so it doesn't need to diff. And that's a fundamentally different thing. I know that DOM diffing, the virtual DOM, is, got, is kind of a buzzword, and everybody is about that because of React, but they don't realize that React is a fundamentally dirty checked system, and that comes with performance and memory problems. Because if you're regenerating and throwing out and regenerating and throwing out, that actually causes garbage to accumulate, and that's not good uh, for memory in the browser, and that's not good for performance and other things over time. And one of the reasons it really is actually twice as fast as React is because we don't do dirty checking. We don't have to do, we don't have to generate a virtual DOM. We don't have to do any kind of diffing. Because of our observer-based model and the way that our templating engine has worked, combining with the asynchronous nature of it via using the microtask queue, we were able to know exactly what changed. Um, we are able to aggregate the changes across DOM nodes, and we are able to batch them as a single render unit to the DOM for super highly performant re-rendering. Um, so no, we don't use DOM diffing, because if we use DOM diffing, it would be slower um, and use up more memory. Um, so this is really a next generation technology inspired by um, the, um, the prototype object observe specification, but implemented on top of uh, browsers using current APIs and using things like the micro test queue and just efficient batching. And that's what makes it really, really fast and also a low memory. <clears throat> OK. And uh, we're back to Paul, where he mentioned about the HTML tag resources. Uh, what he means is, I want to globalize HTML only tags. So can you use HTML only tags as a resource? Yes. And if for some reason that's not working for you, then that's a bug, because that, uh, that obviously is uh, supposed to work. So I'm not sure if you're asking that because you tried it and it didn't work, or because you haven't tried it. If you haven't tried it, try it. If for some reason it's not working, then that is uh, a bug, and we'll fix it for you. OK. And uh, Rob, our next question is a bit of code. Uh, if you go back to the Hangout, you will see I wrote it down. It says, can you prefer bindable properties from a view model directly? Uh, and then he, the gentleman wrote a bit of code. So if you could take a look. <laughs> it's hard to, to actually understand that in the chat window, but let me see. Can you reference bindable properties from a view model directly? And he wants to do... No, the syntax that you're asking to do is not supported, no. You can reference them, yes, but using the syntax that we supply for that, not the syntax that is there. Now, if you wanted to do that, you could actually probably implement that on top of our binding system, because it is extensible. Um, and again, if nobody, if people aren't seeing this code, then this is all very, very vague. But things like dot .bind and dot .ref and dot uh, .two-way and dot .trigger, these are all what we call binding commands in Aurelia. And these commands are actually extensible. You can add your own, and you can extend the parser, and you can extend things to work in ways that you want them to work. So if you have some scenario that you're using a lot and you want to have a nicer syntax for doing it because it's so common in the particular application that you're writing, you can extend it really in a variety of ways from adding new custom elements to adding a new templating or, or new binding syntax to adding new uh, resources into the pipeline that's transformed things on the fly. So there's all kinds of ways that you can extend the system to do that. Now, I usually try to tell people not to add new syntax to the binding language, because that makes it harder to learn how your app was developed 
if somebody comes along behind you and looks at it and it deviates from you know the way every other Aurelia app is written. But it is completely possible. Okay. And also we have another question. How does the HTML batch test downgrade on older browsers? It works fine back to IE9. And we have polyfills that polyfill the various underlying capabilities that we need to make that work. So it, de de it gracefully degrades in terms of how it's implemented, but it works fine. And we support IE9 and above basically any modern ES5-based browser. Okay. I don't want to get uh, too technical with how that's implemented, but, um, but yeah, it degrades gracefully. Sounds good. Looks like that's all the questions. Oh, we have one more. I'm sorry. Uh, can I get IQ Matrix shout out? What? Sorry, didn't understand that. I don't think that's an actual question. But I believe that is about it. Uh, Rob, thanks again. Thanks everyone for joining in. Um, we're going to be posting this video directly on YouTube. So if you have the link, if you want to check it out, just keep using the same link to come back to it so you could just review the whole thing. I want to do again a big shout out to um, uh, Rob and all his team at Aurelia. Thanks a lot for all this. And with that, I wish you guys a awesome evening and a good day. You're welcome. Thank you. Cheers.